Hello and welcome to another Pilates Hour. Excited to see a lot of people come on. I have a very special guest with me today, Dr. Marcia Pareto, originally from Brazil, has been living in the States for many years, lives in Florida, South Florida. Good to have you with us, Marcia. Great. Hey. Uh, we got such an exciting program for everybody today. Marcia, as we get started, I mean, I'd love for people to know a little bit about your story and how you became interested um, in working in this population, your own experience in dealing with it in your own body, sort of maybe the, the high points and the low points as you've gone through this. And I, I would dare to say that a lot of us that have either been in the dance world or performing world, um, you know, we, we're, we're, we have a lot of mobility and we have a lot of mobility problems, uh, typically in the form of hypermobility. And I've always been a little bit skeptical. I have to be honest with you from the beginning of, you know, things like true connective tissue disorders. But as I've aged, I've become much more convinced that there really is something going on. And when I met you, of course, I got really excited about it because you had so much knowledge about it. And so I'd love for you to start just telling us a little bit about your story and how you went through your own struggles and your own solutions and where you are today. So thank you for having me. It's great to be here with, with everyone all over the world. Uh, so it started really, uh, I, I, I was raised being like, always thinking I was the Olympic kid, right? Always getting injured, always having issues, thinking that I was just not trying hard enough. Never gave much attention to it, much less my parents, because I mean, nobody talked about this type of things back then. Um, in nothing really well, I have my daughter had a lot of complications during delivery. And so again, nobody have, has ever noticed anything. And then finally in 2008, at the end of 2008, I was training for a full marathon and I suffered an injury to my right hip. And at that moment, something just didn't heal correctly is what it was being told then. Uh, fast forward 2010, I end up having a hypertroscopy for the labral repair. Uh, surgery didn't take, surgery failed. And the only piece of information that I had was from my surgeon telling me, uh, that's very interesting. There's something wrong with your collagen. Uh, it's you just break you just it just like I, I don't have the tug that I need to have when I cut and things just kind of break apart and that along with the uh, fact that I wasn't improving with the standard protocol and joke on me because I'm, I was a hip specialist then right so I'm rehabbing everyone making everyone feel better getting athletes working with them making them get better from their hips and I couldn't rehab my own and so at that moment, I sat down and I looked, started looking into connective tissue, not, not really even connective. I, I actually Google my first, my first search was a Google, a Google search, uh, collagen, uh, collagen disorders, uh, hereditary collagen disorders. And I just started looking through what was popping. Didn't give much attention, didn't rehab well. We still blame the surgery for whatever reason. 2012, I had the left hip repaired because it was getting really worse six weeks later my right hip got excruciating uh, and I could not walk because I was no weight bearing to one side and not able to bear weight now to the right side again it was for the first time uh, the first ever surgery hypertroscopy is done in different sites within seven weeks the surgeries are not done until like a week a year to a year and a half about and that then I started diving deep because I was told I was going to be disabled. And I was for a year uh, in between wheelchair, walker, crutches. And at that point, everything, everything, it wasn't just the connective tissue. But at that point, uh, I started de developing pot symptoms, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. My gut really got really, really bad. I started developing mast cell activation syndrome. I started to have, and I couldn't rehab. Uh, so everything is just kind of became, I couldn't, and with two hip surgeries, I completely lost control on my pelvic floor. And at that point, things got really, really concerning. At that point, I knew I had to figure out what was this, and I had to put my, my brain to work, my PT brain to work. How do I fix this? And obviously, you don't fix a connective tissue disorder, but how do I rehab myself to the point that I can go back and be athletic again, or at least be able to function and return to my work? My first goal was walking through the grocery store without having to take the little cart. That was my goal number one. 
and that's how the whole thing evolved and uh, fast forward we are 11 years out and I am back to fully functional athletic uh, controlling my symptoms obviously I still have symptoms I'm not cured but I know how to control my flares and everything but it took a lot of work to figure out what worked and what didn't work on the process of rehabilitation yeah I mean what a process too I mean I think that um, you know, I, I, I would be interested to do just a quick poll with our audience and just even to put a thumbs up or a yes if you yourself or somebody you know closely has dealt with these types of issues in your practice or in your years of, of movement, just seeing what's going on there. Because I do think that it's much more common than we think. And, you know, again, it's a spectrum. And I think that's the thing that I'm learning to respect is that it's a, a full spectrum. Some people have it very, very severe. So when you look it up on Google, you see images of incredible severe collagen deficiency and problems. But there's also a middle and uh, the, uh, the high side of that as well in the spectrum. And I think that's, you know, interesting where a lot of people have done that. Now you're, like you said, you're full functioning, you're running a very successful clinic. You've specialized in this population and chronic pain population. Yes. Mm -hmm. You've also discovered Pilates as a very good venue to be able to um, provide that controlled load and that stimulus and that those controlled ranges of motions that are necessary in working with this population. And before we go too much further, what I'd love to do is I love to provide education and solid information. That's really um, outside of really enjoying talking to Marcia. I'm super excited about the actual science and the evidence base that she brings to the game and ways that we can also identify red flags. And even though we might not be an expert in these hypermobility syndromes, we certainly are going to see them and how we know when it's time for us to refer out. So Marcia, I'd love for you to take us through a little bit of classifications, some of the other coexisting or comorbidities that accompany this that might also be red flags that help us to understand and go like somebody coming in complaining, like you said, of gut problems, complaining of, you know, pots and other things like that, that could be a red flag for us. So if we understand what that is, we could be somebody that could help get somebody to the right kind of care. And I think that's a big problem that we see over and over again is if that person goes, and maybe you suffered with this, obviously, as you were searching, and you had the PT brain already, but searching and not finding good answers in the medical mm -hmm. field until you found the right type of practitioner, the right type of doctor information that could help guide you in your recovery. So I think those are some important points. I'd love to go there. Yeah, so I think that still nowadays, it's, as, it's maybe we have more information now, uh, but it's still a challenge to find uh, qualified uh, clinicians that can understand and help through. And many times the person will say, well, I heard of it, but unfortunately, it's still the diagnosis is not maybe it, there's a lot of people out there being underdiagnosed. I just feel like we still need more awareness to this. I think the biggest ways to look at is that this is a, so if we only look at the Ehlers Danlos syndromes, there are 13 uh, connective tissue disorders. They are heritable, right? So you're born with a genetic change that will affect your connective tissue. And each type of them is caused by a, a variant in a specific gene. So, and that gene will provide instructions on the making of the collagens and other related proteins. So there are 13 types. Now, we don't know what is the cause of a hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome yet. Scientists are working and trying to identify what is the gene or genes that could be related to it. And, um, so we we do know 12 of them, right? Uh, some of the EDSs are definitely associated with multiple different genes. So it's not one. Some of them have more than one gene that are faulty and, and, and actually um, uh, creating uh, faulty proteins that will cause the symptoms. And we still don't know, though, the genetic causes for the hypermobile Ehlers illness syndrome. Uh, each type of those EDS ha will have their own set of features with a dis distinct diagnostic criteria. Those are with, with somewhat more of a, the rare types of, doesn't mean that we are not going to come across there. Classical is out there. We see often here in the clinic, 
Uh, we do see a few with uh, vascular as well, but definitely by far, I would say 95, 96% of the population is hypermobility or hypermobile ehlers danlos syndrome. Um, some of the features, though, are very much across all types of the EDSs. For, for example, joint hypermobility and the skin hyperextensibility and the tissue being very fragile. These are things that we see very often across all types. Um, however, people with, uh, uh, with a type of EDS that have, will also have some specific skin characteristics and symptoms that are very unusual. So the skin texture is one thing that we can always, like that patient or that person, that client that comes in and say, I was told I have fibromyalgia. Well, if you notice they are bendy and they were told they have fibromyalgia, a little bit of a question mark should be raised in your brain and say, okay, let me look at a few things on this person. Is that skin really the texture, very velvety? Is very fragile? Maybe they have a scar from a previous surgery or injury that has a stretched out. Uh, so if you ask them, how is your wound healing? They say, you know, it does heal a little slow. You know, it's kind of takes a while. Um, abnormal scar tissue in general. Um, uh, but everyone with TDS will have hyperextensibility or unusual skin characteristics. Now, we're not thinking about if you Google skin hyperextensibility or, or uh, any sort of that, you might find some pictures of people pulling their skin over their face and all that. Those are types, yes, they are. But with the hypermobile, which we are noticing to be the most common one, it's not as extensive, not, not so much more stretchy. Uh, as we might think it will be. So it's very important not to be looking for that. So a question, uh, Marcia, you know, and this is something really interesting to me because I often see patients that have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And I know, and I see some other people putting some comments up. Doug K mentioned that one of the most common misdiagnoses of EDS is people with fibromyalgia. Um, can you expand on that a little bit of like, what are some of the symptoms? I know you have a couple slides that, could help us understand what some of that criteria is that we might see as uh, some red flags for early EDS detection? Yes. So let's, like, why don't we go through the diagnostic criteria for the hypermobile ehlers danlos syndrome, which was uh, uh, created back in 2017 by the International Consortium on the ehlers danlos Syndromes and the Related Disorders. So we'll, we'll get to the fiber, but just let's look at this a little bit. So the first thing we are looking at, it's, it's a, the diagnostic criteria has three levels, criteria one, two, and three. The first thing we're going to be looking at is the Baton score, which can be up to a nine. Uh, we're looking for generalized hypermobility. And this has some limitations, though, because if you guys can see on the screen, what we are looking at will be the pinky finger, the thumb being able to bend all the way to the forearm with the elbow straight, the elbows bending backwards with the arms open to the side of the body, the knees pressing backwards, and being able to touch the floor with the palms flat without bending your knees, without any effort, without any further stretching or anything. So then we are looking at, uh, and this is just important to know, this is like one of the first things we look here at the clinic. Uh, if he, it's a, a, a child prior to puberty, we are looking at the, if they should have a six or more out of the nine in order to qualify. If it is a woman or a man over age of 50 uh, and they are still within, uh, before uh, menopause and andropause, we're looking at a five out of nine. And then if they already went over age of 50, we're looking at a four out of nine on that. But also historical is important. So if they told you they were bendy before, if they told you they could put their feet behind their head and, and play in a hammock, things like that are very important to listen because sometimes that history, that 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 baton is going to be historical. So we need to have at least a four or a five or a six, depending on the age range. That has to be there in order to be hypermobile ehlers danlos syndrome. So on the second slide, we will be looking now at finding two or more of the following features, okay, on the A, B, or C must be present. So here is when we want on feature A, we need five of this. Is the skin velvety? 
is hyperextensible. It is an, the, do you see stretch marks in areas like the back, the groins, the thighs, the breast, the abdomen, uh, and they're not related to uh, gaining or losing weight. You see little papulas, little balls on the heels when the person's standing up. Those are called piezogenic papulas. So there are little, you know, there's a lot of things. There's a person that has a lot of dental crowding or has history of. This is all telling us, all right? And this is just breaking down the criteria. A lot, it can take a whole hour. So I'm going to just briefly look at uh, the feature B, we are looking for some, do, does your mom or your father have history of it? We want to know that. And then the most probably uh, one of the most important parts of it is musculoskeletal pain in one or two more limbs recurring daily for more than or for at least three months. Chronic widespread pain for three months or more and recurrent joint dislocations or uh, in the absence of trauma, those are very important things. Just looking at it, Marcia, I was like thinking for myself, you know, of course, I think everybody is. But Check it's the like, marking, right? there's like, I'm thinking, you know, like right now as I've aged, it's like the stiffness is more prevalent because of the generation. But if I think back in my youth, I mean, there were so many areas on the Brighton store score that I would have been positive on, even though I'm not now over, you know, close to 60, but looking at criteria two and um, A, B, and C, I mean, wow. So it's, right. I mean, yeah, it's a little yeah, scary. On the, on the baton, I, I don't have the thumbs anymore because my thumbs are so arthritic right now and they dislocate. I can literally, I uh, the pinch, I don't really have anymore because the thumb will pop right out. Uh, but I used to literally do that in a, as a party trick. It was interesting <laughs> we thought we thought it was a it was a great thing you know my grandpa had this jumping dancing thumb and we thought it was cool until it wasn't <laughs> interesting and this helps a lot this helps a lot it I, does right yeah. it clarifies a lot and this is available so if you guys just go ahead and google uh you know diagnostic criteria for hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and you can do that for all the other Ehlers-Danlos syndromes as well you're gonna have the diagnostic criteria for that specific popping this one if you just google diagnostic criteria for hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome you're gonna have this document popping there in a pdf format you can print it out uh and have then uh and and use it if you really want to figure that out now criteria three is really important i think it's one of the most important ones and and um along with the others i like to say that <laughs> so all we want to make they're all important right but each one has its own uh, 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 importance to for the differential diagnosis so the absence of unusual skin fragility uh, that could prompt another type of eds so that's very important. We need to rule out other types of failures and illness. So some people might ask, well, is it important that I do a, a, a genetic testing? Um, it, it might be, depending on your presentation, it might be very important because if you, you're, uh, if if we are not too sure that you could present with a different type, your presentation could suggest a different type of EDS, then we might want to do that and rule out that other type so we can rule in hypermobile uh, in, uh, Ehlers Danlos syndrome. And then excluding all other her heritable acquired connective tissue disorders, including the autonomic uh, disorders, right? All the rheumatologic conditions in patients that with acquired CTDs like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, additional diagnosis of heads also requires meeting both features A and B uh, on the criteria two. So feature C of the criteria two is the chronic pain. So all that needs to be present. And then excluding diagnosis, right? That include joint hypermobility, but uh, by means of hypotonia and connective tissue laxity, but it could mean something else like Luidici or Marfan syndrome or other skeletal dysplasias like uh, osteogenesis imperfecta. So it, it's very important that we rule out other things to be certain of what we are going to be dealing with. That's interesting. Right? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, but then we might say, okay, well, but if I don't check box everything that needs to be there, right, for the hypermobile layers downloads, where am I? So uh, if a person is symptomatic, ha has symptomatic joint hypermobility, that, but does not meet the criteria, 
for any type of DEDSs, then this person might actually be in the hypermobility spectrum disorder. And that is an important diagnosis. So just tell someone you don't have AGDS and leave them hanging with all those other symptoms that we're going to talk now. Uh, it's definitely not a way to bring comfort to someone suffering. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And I think that, you know, this is, and I mean, you know, again, just going back to personal challenges with my joints and tissues over the year and thinking how many times I've been dismissed because I don't fall into I'm not, I don't have rheumatoid arthritis, you know, and I've seen this with hundreds of patients as well. You, know, you test negative with a rheumatologist for most of these tests, you're still mm -hmm. suffering. There's still degenerative changes happening because there's too much laxity in the joints. They're still having pain. They're looking for solutions. You know, and sometimes we just like, let's just do Pilates and try to get some control over what you do have. And, you know, but being able to say that you, you might not be diagnosed with EDS um, hypermobility, but you still fall on a hypermobility spectrum. And that's going to lead to these types of symptoms as well, that you can have these. Which is not less important. Right. Being on the hypermobility spectrum disorder can be as severe as having ehlers illness syndrome. So there is this misunderstanding that where, oh, I'm not AGDS or any of the EDS. So now I am less. My symptoms should be less. No, your symptoms could be as severe as someone with AGDS. So I consider myself being on the lower spectrum of the AGDS now because one day I was very severe, but I was able to manage and, and build myself over a period of uh, uh, 12 years. So it wasn't next week <laughs> that I was well. I had to tolerate and, and work on myself and I still make progress nowadays and I still have flares nowadays. Yeah. Let's continue talking about this idea of some of the comorbidities and other things that we had mm -hmm. talked about earlier that you had mentioned that we should probably be aware of as we're talking about hypermobility disorders. Definitely. It's very important. So either AGDS or uh, hypermobility spectrum disorder can present with severe joint or multiple joint pain, it can be more prone to injury, can report severe fatigue, inability to even function throughout the day, right? Headaches, GI problems, autonomic dysfunctions. Um, uh, they're all part of HSD and uh, AGDS. So sometimes we really think that uh, a person with uh, AGDS will be on this timeline where down here is less severe and up here is hard, is way more complex, where the uh, hypermobility spectrum disorder is the same way, like, oh, it's a dial, it's a one, two, three, four volume type of thing. It's not. So if you bring up slide four, the slide is also from the uh, EDS society, um, each person experiences is a combination of specific symptoms, right? So it's not a volume where you dial more or less. So while uh, we have person A complaining of severe joint instability, and this is valid for AGDS and EDS in uh, hypermobility spectrum disorders too, HSD, okay? So while person A can say, hey, I have a ton of shoulder dislocations, hip dislocations, hand dislocations, I have some fatigue, I, my GI is a mess, I have severe headaches, I have a lot of anxiety, person B can say, you know, never had a joint dislocation, but my mass, uh, mass cell activation syndrome is beyond the charts, and my autonomic dysfunction, my POTS, I'm on a wheelchair because of POTS. Can you explain a little bit about the mass cell, just to so, clarify that a little bit so like so inflammatory mast cell it's in, it's actually an immune system reaction coming from the mast cells which are cells that are uh they are they release mediators into our bodies in reaction to something right so you eat something that you're sensitive to or you eat something you're allergic to right epipen type of style and mm -hmm. you're gonna your throat's gonna close that's mast cell or you can have someone that just eats something and becomes very itchy, right? Or feel uncomfortable, fatigued. It could be in any range of it. So mast cell, they're different. That's a whole subject by itself in a lecture. But mast cell activation syndrome and mastocytosis are mast cells going wild. Literally. And I just want to bring that because the mast cell is what's famous for releasing the histamine response, right? Yeah. So if you have a so severe important. histamine response, you can go into 
a type of shock and that's what the EpiPen's for. But that's exactly. that that's that whole allergy spectrum as well of like but some people. mast cell release histamine during exercise too. Mm. So now you get that person with EDS that has mast cell. It's not that bad, you know, never had a, an aphylactic shock, never had anything. And then you put them to exercise and you get them through a routine because we are used to get them working. Let's get you to work. You're going to get strong. And then we release so much histamine on their body. The next day, they are literally unable to get out of bed. And we can keep a person in bed for four or five days with a really bad reaction of MCAS because of overworking that. Just from exercise. That's interesting. We talk about overheating exercises like Absolutely. with MS and those kind of things, but maybe that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we're talking about, right? <laughs> that's that too, because there's the, the, the overheating as well. That is the yeah. autonomic dysfunction to the yeah. overheating. So learning to slow down. So understanding your client is such a huge key because that will be that client or that patient for the physical therapist that came to therapy and then calls you on the next day in the office and say, what did you do to me? I'm so much worse today. Mm. You know, so yeah, understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who didn't, right? Yeah, I did yeah. it with even my own my own self. Like, yeah. what did I do exactly. to myself yesterday? Exactly. Right. So, right. Let's just a couple clarifications and questions. Let's break. First of all, you. I forgot to mention that you're an author of a book, and the book's actually behind you. And somebody's asking, "What is the <laughs> book behind Marcia?" So maybe just do a quick shout out for that, and we'll definitely put that all in right. the post production. So this is just a, uh, it's a simple book directed to patients, but actually being told by several therapists that was very helpful in guiding uh, the therapists on dosing the exercises and understanding how all the other comorbidities can affect on the treatment of the patient. So we just, me and my, and my uh, co-author, um, Dr. Uh, Pereira, Marlon Pereira from the University of Miami. We collaborated together and we wrote this book with the intention of helping people to understand how to structure the exercise without and taking into consideration all the comorbidities. Yeah, great, great. <laughs> all right. So there's a couple other questions in here. Some of them we're going to answer when we get into the next section about you know how we manage flares and how the kind of hope and treatments that we're going to be talking about. So I know Dr. Pareto is going to be talking about that in the next section. So we'll definitely answer those questions. And mm -hmm. then there was a question by Marcy Evans that said, what special considerations do you have for young women with an EDS diagnosis versus older students with EDS? And I'm talking specifically about sort of post-puberty 13 to 20. But if you'd like to discuss prepubescent, that's okay too. So talking about that sort of young adolescent versus a mature adult. So we, we have all, uh, actually the clinic, we have our youngest is a uh, 11 year old that we work with and our oldest is an 80. <laughs> so we have all ages, but the majority is about 18 to 43, 44, a greater majority. It's, it's in reality, uh, bringing, first thing we need to do is bring awareness. We need to understand them sit down and take a long conversation, understand everything that exists within the person, understand what activities, when they do an activity, what happens to them? Do you overheat? Do you go with your family, do an activity, and you become very exhausted? Learn first what triggers your patient or your client, because the answers they're giving you are the are they're telling you how to treat them if you really listen. And right? we spend, yeah, we spend a lot of time in Polestar in particular about asking for the story, right? So the yes. idea of not not superimposing that or being authoritative, but asking them, you know, what do you participate in? What do you believe you should be participating in? Mm -hmm. What do you believe is not allowing you to participate if you can't participate? And letting them tell their story rather than us telling them, oh, do you have yes. this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Yes, exactly. You know, that's like asking somebody, you know, is your pain, do you have, what, can you describe your pain? And they're starting to think about it and go, is it hot, because stabby, sticky, sharp? It. Right. Yeah, but we are suggesting it. So we don't want to tell, so tell me how, tell me about your day. What yeah. would you like to do that you can't? What do you like doing that actually works well for you? Let them elaborate, give them open-ended questions, but just guiding the sense of, okay, what do I want to listen? What do I learn? I want to learn more. So yeah. I like to start here at the clinic. I always tell you, 
tell me about you. I know you wrote this whole entire form, which is in the clinic is ginormous here that we ask about everything. I said, I don't want to read that. I already did, though. I prepped for each case <laughs> 24 hours before. But I said, I don't want to read that now. Tell me with your own, in your own words, how can I help you? How are you feeling limited? What would you like to do? What are your goals? Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. and obviously you need to know obviously what is their autonomic dysfunction if they have and sometimes people will show up to you and they have not been diagnosed yet yeah and you have to ask specific questions to understand it yeah appreciate so that. for children for children though it's more like that intolerance sorry brand i just want to put it out there no, for younger the, the school age ones it's important to understand how difficult for them to sit up in classroom how difficult for them to even focus in classroom doing their homework uh how does their preferred position seating or doing their homework at home or in school can you play during recess things like that are very important to understand uh awesome. for the university age already or the young moms can you sit with your kid play with them on the floor can you walk them to the school these are all important yeah things. i i had a patient that uh had to lay down during class in college because she couldn't tolerate this and she was one semester away from graduating and it just got so bad that you know she basically would bring in a couple cushions and made arrangements with the professor to be able to just lay down and take recordings of the sound so she could go back home and process the information because she really wanted to graduate but she just couldn't tolerate sitting in a chair for an hour lecture that's how yeah. bad it was. And it, this happens. And I have written a, a, a ginormous number of letters for accommodation, special accommodation in the schools. Yeah, that's great. Because they need it. Mm -hmm. There's one more question before we jump into the next section. And this is from Joe McDonald. And I think this is a, a really valid question. Uh, she says, which is best discipline to refer a patient that you suspect may have EDS? Hematologist, rheumatologist, GI, all of the above. How, how do people find the right type of practitioners to collaborate with if they are seeing these type of symptoms coming in with their clientele so uh that that's a very good question um so it you, you can get started with genetic counseling as uh, some insurances will not allow you to start with genetic counseling there is that too um but if you can you can start with genetic counseling but if that is not available to you rheumatology is also a great door to start with because rheumatology is going to rule out all the rheumatological conditions and will uh, and they will be able to say this is looking like something else now we need to have you see a geneticist but yet at a point we need to bring in and i get people sometimes that come in to me and they haven't seen anyone they just suspect they have been doing what i did to learn my diagnosis right. they're on google right yeah dr google. and dr google google is great um until it's not um <laughs> <laughs> there is google syndrome too by the way there is, right? right? Yeah, I mean, self-diagnose and we become more intelligent than our doctors and we tell our doctors what to do and that gets but, a little... you know, EDS patients are extremely versed on their diagnosis though. And this mm. is a great thing. It's a great thing, which kind of backfires on us sometimes as patients because we know a little more than the doctor and the doctor sometimes doesn't like that because yeah. we are trying to tell them that there is something wrong and they are unfortunately they didn't get that education it's not their fault they haven't been educated they yeah. has not been out there enough yeah. so but yeah if you get that patient that person for the first time refer back either to their pcp if it's one of those insurance they need to go back to the pcp but tell them hey i really suspect here take to your clinician this criteria show them this you might have this talk to them see if your doctor likes it or not yeah. agrees or not well and that's that's exactly the point like i find the the two ends of that spectrum we've used that word a lot today but the idea of those that buy into the idea that there is a connective tissue disorder there is a genetic disorder there is a syndrome mm -hmm. that has a number of categories that can be helped and that's where we're going to go next is talking about how do we establish hope for our clients and patients that have been diagnosed or are suffering from a lot of these symptoms. And a couple of the questions that are in there we'll address as we go through this next portion of what kind of hope, what kind of things can we do as practitioners? I think at the same time, it's like, how do we provide education without creating hysteria, right? How do we, yes. without being, um, you know, uh, inflating 
the idea of it or catastrophizing it and how can we take some of that stress off of our clients by creating some hope and creating some direction and of course in the education like you talked about both in what you have written in the book and also us as practitioners not sensationalizing the diagnosis how do we you know meet them where they need to be and to be able to diffuse the anxiety aspect that accompanies this kind of a diagnosis of not knowing or or even when they go and they look at it and they realize that there are people that are suffering so severely from the disease and they might have the same exact diagnosis how do we minimize that catastrophization through our communication education and practice mm -hmm. and and we have to think this and um so a, a shout out to actually to Doug that says, don't forget all this applies to males with EDS also. And it is so true because 75% might be women, let's put it about this way. But yeah, right? Raise your hand right there, Ren. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there is a large population of males to suffering with this. And we have a couple here in the clinic. We might have a majority of women, but there is there's men here that actually have gone through a lot and, and needed attention. So yes, it's a, a smaller population, but they in they need they need that attention as well as much as women uh, i think the biggest thing here that we need to look at uh, also when we the diagnosis of hsd or agds comes along a bunch of other diagnoses and that can be pretty scary because when you sit down with someone and you take their history and you say okay you never seen anyone how am i going to break to this person that they need that all this dizziness is actually could be POTS related and all this GI stuff could be that they have GI issues and difficulty digesting and or slow digestion and now we need a uh, GI doctor and now we need a cardiologist and now we need a mast cell specialist because it sounds like there is a huge issue with the mast cell activation syndrome and all of a sudden you have to tell them you got to see all these physicians here here's a referral for each one of them and that's scary. It's yeah. overwhelming. It's scary. So it's like, okay, great. I got a diagnosis and I have a bonus of another four or five, right? Mm -hmm. And I still don't have a solution. Yeah. I, I only got a bunch of labels. And that, that was probably the most scary part for me. Yeah. I think that's right on the money too. I think that's that's what I see with people coming in. Let, <laughs> excuse me. Let's jump into the next section, Marcia, and let's talk a little bit about now creating hope and communication and designing programs and certain techniques that we can use that you found very successful in creating baseline and creating levels of function that are, you know, better than where they are when they come in. Like, how do we you know, it, I, I find any time I'm dealing with chronic pain or chronic dysfunction or chronic degenerative disease, it's not about finding the cure for it. It's mm -hmm. about how do we improve function? How do we improve quality of life? How do we create hope in our clients and our patients, even though they might have a, a life-threatening degenerative disease? How mm -hmm. do we improve the quality of life? So I'd love to hear you share a little, a little bit about mm -hmm. your thoughts on that. So the, the first thing is meet your client where they are, okay? You have to meet your client where they are. It's not, uh, it's not about the agenda we have. It's the agenda that that client needs. So sometimes we need to break down that exercise that before used to be so big, right? That leg goes all the way in and all the way out or that arm flows everywhere. All of a sudden, that might have to be worked in an inner range or in a mid range. Mm -hmm. Right. All of a sudden, you cannot be using long lever, but you have to cut it back and use in a short lever. So instead, yeah. that strap to be on the hands or on the feet, that strap might be below the knee or by the elbows. That was uh, Jenny Adams' question that came in was just, oh, okay. you know, the idea of end range stretching particularly with these clients. So just again, to let Jenny know that we, we saw that. And the thing is, is that we often like that feel of end range. Like I know I do. Um, I like to feel that end range stretching, but the question is, is maybe that end range is not where we want to be. Maybe mm -hmm. we want to be 80% or 75% of that range in building control. Maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. So that's the thing, uh, because we, uh, uh... These patients or these clients have a very poor proprioception. That's a very important point to think. Proprioception and body awareness 
is is really com uh, compromised on this clientele and if you're bringing them to that extra range of motion and uh, it, which is normal in a pilates exercise naturally would be normal we don't know where our bodies are in the space so if you take that leg beyond end range and looking for a stretch you, you, we don't even feel the stretch because we are compensating and locking joints on the process to gain that range. Hanging right? on the ligaments and the connective tissue. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the goal is really making sure that you can help the load to be distributed and move correctly to rebalance those forces throughout that fascia line. So don't, don't look into, it, it starts small, literally it starts small. Make sure the person knows where their arm or their legs are in the space. Make sure they're not locking. Make sure that there is, if you're doing leg work uh, or you're on straps or you're doing footwork on the reformer, that you're not noticing those SCM muscles, scaling, everything just tightening up because they're like overworking up above the chain to try to get that work correctly or the toes position correctly. This is all important. So that footwork might be shorter than you normally anticipate. Yeah, yeah. Megan McLeod made a comment on here, uh, Marcia, sort of talking about going to the EDS Echo Summit and that she heard a lot about from the physical therapist talking about how good Pilates is for EDS and, and coming across it. And she also reconfirmed that they were talking about the same thing of, you know, you want to be able to stretch large muscle groups, but you don't want to hang on joints. And I think mm -hmm. that's a huge takeaway from uh, for us as movement teachers is that idea of when you watch somebody going into feet and straps and you see them in a recurvatum and their knee hyperextended, you know, that's that should be a trigger. Or if you see them yes. going down and hanging on a hip ligament or hanging on their, you know, spine ligaments, like in a rollover or something like that, that we don't, we want to try to create that space or sort of that axial elongation mm -hmm. through that joint or through the combination of joints, which would tell us that mobility is controlled with muscle activation versus controlled by end of range ligamentous blocking, right? So like you yeah. would see in these ranges. So thank you, and, Megan. And and, yeah, and, and welcome and, welcome to the webinar too by the way i think this is our first webinar and she was very excited to hear dr pareto talk about this so <laughs> thank, thank you, you for as welcome us. thank you for being here so I, I think the biggest thing is like remember so number one thing also when you get that that client on your reformer or on your mat see where they are that day this population and i can vouch for myself there are many days i have to just sit down and center myself we are in fight or flight mode we're in full on fight or flight. We don't know what's going to dislocate. We don't know when our knee is going to give from underneath us. Uh, we don't know if we might have been having a bad flare of pain throughout the week. All that needs, you know, let's, how are you doing? Let's do some breath work. Let's ground you. Let's bring your awareness to your body so we know what is what is most needed before we even start flowing. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that a lot, too. And I think that that centering and one of the things we talk about, Marcia, quite often is how do we establish the ability to be present? Right. Mm -hmm. Because if we're caught up in the worry or we're worried about what the exercise might feel like when we're having a flare could be overcoming the ability for us to even like that centralized pain too going on simultaneously that we triggered something because we're anxious and by coming in, maybe doing a little bit of meditation and breath work before we start our workout mm -hmm. could bring us into center and then allow us to listen to our bodies. And I think that's the, you know, there was a couple of questions they're talking about specific exercises. And I want to get away from the idea of specific exercises as much as how they process the movement themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think we, in this situation, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you and I are very much on the same page with this, but if we can educate the client or the patient to be aware of what that feels like mm -hmm. to both be in control with muscle or to be hanging on connective tissue, if they can be in charge of that, then that day they could listen to what those femur arcs and circles feel like and talk to their mm -hmm. body. And they can know like, this is as far as I'm going today because I can control this. Yes. 
I can't each control session that. is different. different. Each yeah. session, you could be like in a very high level session the day before, and the next day you are literally having to peel it back significantly. And it might not even be pain. It just might be that we are not centered enough to perform. Now, yeah. Go I was ahead. just going to say, in, in yoga, you talk about bandhas, right? So in yoga, yes. we talk about mm -hmm. mula bandha, jalahara bandha, mansi bandha, all the bandhas. And what yes. the bandha is, is a co-contraction around a joint complex. Yes. So it doesn't matter what joint it is. And thinking what you're talking about just made me trigger this, thinking like, you know, if we could teach control of bandhas around the different joint, whatever joints they're yeah, experiencing exactly. hypermobility, we're going to minimize trauma to that connective tissue around those joints and which is the, the kinetic control theory right yes. it's just we want to focus first so think about this when you're in chronic pain your deep joint stabilizers right so we have the movers the hybrids and the and the joint stabilizers in kinetic control and if you get the the because of the, the pain those uh deep joint stabilizers will be the first ones to shut off to shut down they they are no longer stabilizing right and now you have a, a passive structure ligament capsule that is already too stretchy so you lost your active control and your passive control is insufficient now what's happening your hybrids and your movers your primary mover muscles are spasming up trying to control that range, time to stabilize the joint so also going into that extra range and stretching that person you're taking the rest of the little bit of stability that's left through muscle spasm yeah that was abrio catano's question right he was asking oh, great. The, or she um, was asking about should you stretch the stretchy joints and that's you know it's like no <laughs> no no and never stretch something that you cannot stabilize in the session if uh, not not even the word stretch i, I actually try to steer away from that oh, word too. but yeah never release true movement or through a ball roller whatever never release a muscle group that you will not get to stabilize the joint that that muscle group in a spasm is providing stability if you do that patient can get hurt and that reminds me of something you said as far as also the us as physical therapists or myofascial release therapists massage therapist and you said something that really resonated with me could you talk a little bit about this idea of releasing the muscles that are controlling those joints in these patients and them having an exacerbation afterwards rather than seeing what we might see in somebody that has uh doesn't have a connective tissue disorder so i mean it's it's um if you so like i just said if we actually release so that muscle spasm is serving us is serving a purpose that muscle spasm that quad muscle spasm that uh quadris lumborum muscle spasm is serving your purpose is holding something so if you are going to release let's say true movement and you're going to do something to get that movement re, uh, uh, to, to, uh, release, that spasm released and recover that movement. Make sure you're going to do a local activation of that joint and then do a integration of that movement throughout the body. Because the, if you just do a joint, that we are not a joint, we're a body, right? So let's integrate because, you know, from the theory of when the foot, the feet hit the ground, everything changes. When you got a patient up from that reformer, if you did not integrate the movement, that person is going to fall. Yeah, not in front of you, over. but yeah. later on or something. Or they're going to spasm up all over again and your work was good for nothing. So release what you can work with. If you cannot get to it, do not touch it. You know, one thing I've thought about a lot, uh, Marcia, is the idea of where, you know, we often think in the fitness and wellness world that we're going to strengthen muscles and stretch muscles or stretch tissue. And one of the things we've tried to emphasize in the Pilates especially is that the power and mobility should be happening simultaneously yes. in the movement. I could see that being very applicable in this yes. population that we're not looking to do isolated stretching or Never. isolated mm -hmm. strengthening. It is the whole kinetic chain of movement and function that we should be working within the range that they can control. And that range can increase as they have more control. So a little different than in the surgery world where they say, oh, this joint is stable now after surgery. You know, they're talking about a fixation of a ligament or a tendon or a capsule 
or a bone, right? In movement, stable means control of mobility for us. Mm -hmm. So to have more mobility than you have control. So for example, we see this a lot in our dancer, gymnast, acrobatic world, where they can have excessive mobility and they don't often have the control of it, right? So to exactly. me, that that's a disadvantage. And we see people that are super tight, but they have control over their movement. They could be in a better position to avoid some of the injuries that we see with that. Yeah, it's the, the, the idea of load distribution again, right? I already mentioned this before. We need to actually rebalance the forces that are going through this person's body. So we will be able to improve their mobility and strength. And strength, we also have to remember, so this, so for in practical, uh, in practice, let's apply this in practice. Uh, make sure you meet your client where, where they are. Make sure you ground them because being fight or flight can be detrimental to an exercise session. Work with them starting this um, sh smaller range of motion. Don't need to go all the way out of range for sometimes many and many weeks. You can work with things. You know what a good thing to start with closed chain. Connect them to something. Proprioception, yeah. Proprioception, right? And yeah. uh, with a still the closed chain, right? Uh, <laughs> connect. That was the one one cool thing. You, you picked that up from us. <laughs> <laughs> I the think you picked that up chain. from me. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Who came first, the chicken or the eye? That was a know. great. That was a great coincidence. So the pseudo closed chain idea: connect them to something, give them something, a band, a ring, a yoga block put them in contact with the bar on the reformer or the slings, whatever it is, you will see that their proprioceptive input improves. They know where they are all of a sudden. So no arms and legs floating on the air throughout. Right. It might not be the best idea. Shorten the, le the lever, right? Shorten the lever. Put that, uh, that handle maybe on the elbows or below the knees. Uh, make the movement smaller. Slow down. Look more for if they are activating and using the correct muscles because we have a master's if not a doctorate degree in finding other muscles that will do the move for us we yeah. will be using muscles we will be substituting muscles when you see we are not using transverse abdominal any longer but we're still doing it looks great it's just that we are not using the right muscles so slow the movement shorten the lever um don't Make it a complex exercise. Meet your client where they are. Give breaks because that can be a problem too. Exercise back to back. And we've we've mentioned a lot of these things. I want to just be clear that there are some very special precautions that Dr. Pareto has been mentioning yes. as she's gone through this that I think we as Pilates teachers and physical therapists and personal trainers, and I'm assuming we have people on here that are also suffering from the impairment of, of EDS or hypermobility uh, syndromes. But the idea is that there are precautions. And that's one of the things that we mm -hmm. want to accentuate in Polestar is that if you want to be able to work with a diverse population, you have to be able to re-appreciate, as Dr. Pareto said, it's meeting the client where they are and understanding the pathology so that we can create that optimal environment. And when we talk about the principles of movement, this is the idea of where we look at that balance between things like breath, mobility, alignment, control, and then movement integration. And as we build those positive sequences that represent function, I think everything has to represent function in this population, um, that we can see these successes going. And just, to, Marcia, what are some other things that you've seen? Like maybe give some examples of some success stories that you had besides your own, but some other success stories you've seen of people that have come in that have been a little on the hopeless side of an EDS diagnosis, an HEDS diagnosis, and how they've been able to, you know, with this idea of gradual progression, internal feedback, proprioceptive training, avoiding hanging on the ligaments, how have you been able to help some of them to be able to return to a much higher level of function? So we, we have multiple uh, cases that have been successful, went through the entire program and did achieve success and return to work even. Um, so we have had people that have gotten here unable even to tolerate upright position. Uh, they would have to exercise lying down at first 
in order to get them to build some sort of muscle strength and tolerance to upright position. So I, I really like to get them through the developmental stages like a baby, right? Because that's mm -hmm. the easiest mm -hmm. way. Like re give the body what the body's yep. familiar. Exactly. Yep. The body's familiar with that, right? We went through this for, uh, for yep. a couple of years. So uh, we have had, we, you have to take into consideration that um, this, this patients will have a POTS, mast cell, and other fibro, like we are, we're getting that fibro popping all the time. There's chronic pain all over. You have to address all this. So you have to go piece by piece, finding what is going to help to that person. So for example, there is one case of a, a guy, let's speak a guy for the sake of difference here. When he started with us, he could not even be upright. It took him about a year and a half. Okay. So we see them once a week. We do, do a homework uh, for them to do a couple times a week, depending on how they are progressing and uh, we, or, or how they tolerate. Right. And we dial this based on the need, like, well, we need to decrease because it's too intense. We need to increase. It's getting better. It took him about a year and a half. He's back to full-time uh, work right now. He works. He actually came to, comes to the clinic to for our wellness. He runs around the corridor. We see him going up and down. It's, it's great. And we have other cases similar to it. People that were in disability and now have been able to return to their activities and return even to work. Some of them because they chose to. That's awesome. I mean, it, and I think the thing that has to be uh, conveyed to them that you just demonstrated is it's not an overnight kind of cure. Like we're not going to, there's not a pill, there's not a surgery, there's not a manipulation that's all of a sudden going to make this go away, no. that it is going to be their responsibility it's and it's a process and we educate. And one of the things we talk about in Polestar is that we impact global well-being and, and health through the education and practice of intelligent movement. And this is exactly fits into this that Marcy is talking about as far as, you know, how do we grade them? And there were a couple of comments in here and we're getting close to the end of our, our hour, but I did want to share um, one in particular. And it was uh, Fiona had mentioned that when she has a you know, client that comes in that does have the GI symptoms as well, that she has made accommodations to do things like she she doesn't charge them cancellation fees, you know, so she makes it a little more convenient for them when they're dealing with those kind of things because they can't leave the house if their GI is mm -hmm. freaking out, like they don't want to have an accident somewhere that they can't control. And, you know, it's having the empathy, not necessarily sympathy, but empathy and compassion, empathy. Mm -hmm. right, of where these individuals are coming from. And then there's another comment, um, and I'm going to keep the name out of it because it's a personal comment. Just the fact that we share the same doctor, Dr. Barth Green, was my surgeon for my neck surgery uh, 12 years ago. And just the idea of trying to build, uh, she, she was sent to do Pilates and had had some hip pathologies and labrum tears, which a lot of us, that's sort of where we discovered mm -hmm. those things was labral tears and labral tears in the shoulder or the hip or uh, unstable lumbar spine uh, ligaments and cervical ligaments and that it was scary for her. And I think this is a common kind of experience, even going through and doing private sessions for a while. It's like it can be scary. And I think with the approach that Marcia mentioned of taking them one day at a time, how they arrive to our clinic or our studio is how we process and design that exercise program for that day, right? I mean, it's, I for think that, that day, it's for, for that, that day. day because yeah. we, we don't know what is going to be if the next session is a flare. And it's, it's a partnership, Brent. Uh, it's, it's a partnership between you and your client or you and your patient. You both need to have a lot of communication. It's not about this is the program. You have to fit my program. We, it's a partnership. Okay, what can you give today? What can I get from you that day? And how can I make you have a great session even thought you're not feeling that great? It is a partnership to help them at inch warm pace get better. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's the little micro wins that add up. We talk about having a positive movement experience. Uh, that positive movement experience over time does increase the mental health of somebody that's suffering from chronic disease yes. like this. And then also can build the confidence of knowing that they're going to have flares. It's just they now know how to manage them and how to rest appropriately and not to think that that's a permanent thing or my disease is back. It's like there's going to be flares. 
there and will this be is flares. how we manage them, right? And you, like you mentioned, yes. you yourself have flares. I occasion. still have flares yeah. and I just need to figure out what I need that day. It's yeah. what can I do? The, the spoon theory. For those that don't know, go look for the spoon theory. You will understand. There's a great, <laughs> a great question from Paola Grasso. And I think this is very appropriate. And um, she talks about how one of her clients with EDS uh, needs a, a heavier spring load uh, in the exercise. And this, again, is going to vary client to client, input. right? But it's proprioceptive input. So a yeah. lot of times, the lighter the spring, the less assistance. So if you think of how Joe Pilates designed the work is the mat calisthenic work was mm -hmm. the most difficult work. And the springs were there to help assist and to educate the body's movement through space. So that's why that person might do better with a heavier load because they're getting more information into their yeah. nervous system. Don't load so much that it becomes a challenge and becomes a, 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 you know, a weight lifting session, but don't make it so light that the person doesn't know where their legs or arms are in the space. Yeah, yeah. and I can right? appreciate that. I love that sense of load, not necessarily heavy load, but axial load. Like if you yes. can think of just getting axial load through the ligaments and the connective tissue um, is, is very powerful of knowing that I'm okay. Like I know that my, my body's intact. I can and we are building strength through those tissues by stimulating cell deposition, mm -hmm. building resilience to the ligaments. And, you know, it, it's part of it. It's not only muscle strength. Well, we are out of time. And it I know that you wrong. and I could talk for hours. I hope that everybody yes. has been, I mean, this is probably one of my favorite webinars and I've done hundreds so far. I have to thank you, Marcia. Thank you. That, that um, was really great. I mean, I know part I of it is it. selfish because I'm very interested in this for myself, but I also think it just emulates the so many concepts that we teach and then being able to apply it to a special population that it really pops for us to understand that, you know, these are the tools that we have. It's how we use the tools to meet the individual where they are with the condition that they're dealing with that day. And yes. there was a question there about how to do, how to integrate them into a movement class. Well, it's education, right? So in the private sessions with anybody, if we can teach them what their body's telling them and they can learn to listen to it, then they can participate in any activity they want to, as long as they respect the communication coming from their body, right? So it's not that they can't participate in group class, but you'd want to spend some time helping them to understand their bodies and what their limits are and how to listen to those mm -hmm. limits before they would go into a group class and potentially yes, have a definitely. negative experience, right? Definitely, yes, definitely, yes. It is, this, this is a, a, a diagnosis or a condition that we need to first teach them a lot in one-on-one -on -one, uh, setting, in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And then when we know they are safe, then we can move them to a smaller group. Yeah, still not, not the full class, a large one. So I want the audience to know that you and I have been talking about putting together, collaborating to build a course specifically for uh, hypermobility and hypermobility yes, types of syndromes. So That's if exciting. if you are interested out there in this, keep your eyes open. Probably in the next number of months, we'll be introducing something and super excited to work with you, Marcia. You've been a wonderful guest and I'm sure everybody appreciates Thank it. Thank you for having Is me. Is there it's any amazing. last thing that you'd want to share with the audience regarding the topic today uh i just you know i think if we all put our hearts to it if we all like put uh, uh it, it work on this together the we all can the collaboration is huge pilates instructors therapists physicians nurses whatever is your profession let's work together we need unity so we can help these patients and this is going to make their life so much easier i know because it's going to make mine a lot easier as a patient and i know they've seen the people that i see in my office every day and their frustrations if we all get together we can we can change the life of many people that's awesome. All right, Marcia, thank you again. Thank you, everybody thank you. out there and those who will be watching as a recording. Um, we always have a lot of great activities happening. So check out the Polestar Pilates website for upcoming courses. Critical reasoning is going to be showing up again in the fall if you're interested in that. And uh, above all things, be kind, have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next week, Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you, Brent. Thank you all.